The video you're about to watch was recorded in early January. I think we can all agree that seems like a century ago. If you followed our news reporting on AvWeb, or any news reporting, you know how devastating the COVID-19 pandemic has been on the people directly affected by it and on every aspect of the economy, including aviation. The airlines have parked hundreds of airplanes, passenger load factors are half what they were a month ago, and international flying has also slowed to a crawl. In general aviation, some flight schools have stopped training entirely and flight activity is down, in some places by a lot. Many events, big and small, have been canceled and we expect many more. With AirVenture four months away, we don't know if it's a go either. Hoping for the best. And even though I'm self-isolating here in my home office, we keep going. Yes, this impact is unprecedented, but when 9-11 happened, so was it. And when the 2008 financial crash happened, so was it. But we got through those and we will get through this. We always have and we always will. So be smart about how you protect yourself and your family. And remember that thing about community responsibility. And we will be done with this soon enough. I wish you health and safety. And thanks for watching. Hey everyone, it's Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb and Aviation Consumer. I'm with Jared Curtis of Diamond Aircraft. We're in London, Ontario, where if you look outside the window, it is a frozen Arctic wasteland. We are about to commit aviation in a, a DA-40NG. And before we get into the specifics of the NG, talk about the engine. So what makes the NG the NG? Well, it's this. This is the Austro A300 diesel engine, which is the marketing name for it. The official name is the E4. Where does it come from? It comes from the OM640 diesel uh, that Mercedes-Benz developed years ago, the early 2000s, for the A-series sedans, specifically the uh, A100. They made gazillions of them, and the good thing about that is they had a lot of developmental dollars, so they could improve the technology and also the quality. In modern industrial manufacturing, the more stuff you build, the higher the quality it is. It's best to think of this as an automotive adaptation, not a conversion, and I'll get to that in a minute. Now, you know about the Tealert engines that Diamond used in the original DA-42. They also use the OM640 as the basis, but with one important difference. They used a lot of aluminum in the block and the heads, and that caused some maintenance issues. When Ostro developed its A300, it stuck with the original cast iron. That means that this engine is more durable and it's overhaulable. It has an 1800 hour TBO, time between overhauls. The cost of the overhaul is roughly the same as a Lycoming four-cylinder, about $28,000. In the Tealert engines, now Continental, there's a TBR, a time between replacement. The entire engine has to be replaced, and that's because they use aluminum instead of cast iron, at least that's one reason. As for the engine itself, it's a four-cylinder, inline, turbocharged, Got high pressure common rail electronic fuel injection. This is very common in diesels and even in some uh, gasoline engines. It's got four valves per cylinder and dual overhead cams. And the valve train is, is not direct acting, but it uses roller lever arms to operate the valves from the camshaft. Now, Bosch developed the fuel system for this, the fuel injection system, specifically for an aviation use. They actually stood up an aviation unit to develop it. So they developed uh, the electronic engine control units, EECUs, which operate the fuel injection and the engine overhaul, including an electronic uh, turbocharger wastegate. The system runs at uh, 23,000 PSI, and that's a lot of pressure. And the reason they need that kind of pressure is because that allows the fuel charge to be carefully shaped. And that is how modern diesel engines get efficiency. A fuel charge is very carefully calculated against mass air and temperature and other factors, so it's just the right amount of fuel at just the right time. You probably know from reading about aircraft engines that 
automotive engines develop their best torque at around 4,000 RPM. Well, it's too fast for a prop. So, Ostro needed to develop a gearbox, which they did, and it reduces the uh, crankshaft speed from 1.6 to 1, 2300 max on the RPM. Probably also know that diesel engines have really powerful power pulses. And this is a challenge for designers because they have to figure out a way to damp those vibrations so as not to cause damage to the engine or the airframe. In this case, we have to protect the prop. So the crankshaft itself has eight counterweights and that helps with that. And Ostro developed a torsional vibration dampener, uh, which can best be thought of as a automotive clutch, but without the pressure plate. And that absorbs some of these pulses so they don't affect the prop. Weight wise, the AE300 weighs 112 pounds more than the Teelard engine did, now Continental, and 280 more than the Lycoming four cylinder. That's a lot of weight, and so how did Diamond deal with it? Well, they certified the airplane at a higher weight. It's 2,888 pounds for the NG versus 2,535 pounds for the Lycoming version. Now, the old production model, the original production model from Ostro, was to buy the engine directly off the Mercedes-Benz assembly line, shipped right to the Ostro plant in Austria. They stripped off the automotive parts and added on the aviation specific parts for the certified engine. That turns out to be a fairly long list. It's the gearbox, it's the high pressure fuel pump, a new engine harness that's lighter and specific for aviation. The alternator and the starter were converted to 28 volt because that's the standard aviation voltage and they added a new glow plug controller and we had to use that today because it's really cold here in London and the diesel needs that to get started so the fuel's at least warm enough to ignite uh, compression ignition. It also has a prop governor and a redesigned engine sump. Now Ostro realized when they made this deal with Mercedes-Benz that the product cycle would move forward and eventually they wouldn't be able to buy these engines off the assembly line that would be suitable for the airplane. So they plan for this, and what they've done as of this spring is to bring the production of the engine blocks and the heads and all the casting in-house. So Ostro is building its own blocks. This particular engine is not an Ostro cast block. Those will come along later, probably sometime in 2020. So what's the end result? Well, it's an efficient engine. Engine efficiency is described by BSFC, or brake specific fuel consumption. It's pounds of fuel per horsepower hour. In the case of the AE300, it runs at about 0.33 pounds per horsepower hour. A Lycoming typical four cylinder is in the low fours to mid fours. So it's a more efficient engine, it's a smoother engine. Now we'll go back up into the airplane and talk about how that translates to flyability. I was uh, talking about the engine uh, previously. I mentioned that the uh, Ostro is liability, so its operability and its operability is very much uh, like a modern automotive engine, which it should be because it comes from uh, automotive development. This uh, engine has a, a pair of EECUs, electronic engine control units. Uh, Jared, we, we did the run up, and the run up is automatic it's, you've got two of them you've got an a and a b and then you hold down the ecu test button and it automatically goes through a test cycle but the two ecus um, are used alternately correct in, in normal flight uh yeah so it'll run both are always running 100 percent of the time so if one was to fail the other can pick it up immediately without any sort of hesitation uh, when we did that check on the ground, you felt the hesitation. That's actually artificial. That was uh, that was that's in the software to make sure that uh, uh, that the pilot can feel the switchover because uh, it actually doesn't have any any lag to switch over. So if we lost 
uh, say we were running on ECU A right now and it was to, to have an issue, it would automatically switch to ECU B and it would just give us an ECU A failure on the screen. Uh, and that would, that would be the entire event. We'd go back and land and find a mechanic to, to troubleshoot just like anything else. And also, like an automotive engine, this has an onboard diagnostics OBD. Plug it in. Uh, and you can read whatever faults the engine may have, but uh, also importantly, you can read its operational history. Yeah. And eventually, I guess that'll be used for uh, predictive maintenance and, and yeah. just uh, data monitoring for it, what the engine's doing, where it's going. Yeah, so it, it already essentially is doing that. So Austro Engine um, uh, is the only shop that can overhaul the Austro Engine right now. And part of that is because they take that entire history so they can see the service history, how the engine behaved, and then compare it to the physical engine in terms of wear points and everything on the engine so that they can uh, know how the engine's holding up and they can use that data along with the physical inspection, dimensional inspection of all the wear components in the engine for uh, TBO extensions in the future. That's the idea. Now, of course, the Lycoming version of this, the XLT, uses the IO360, which is a 180 horsepower engine. Uh, it's fuel injected. So, in, in the, between the XLT and the NG, we can compare two things. We can compare diesel against gasoline, and we compare uh, turbocharged against normally aspirated. So, as far as performance is concerned, you look in the POH, and what we see flying the airplane is that the XLT at sea level will have slightly better takeoff performance, but it's not much. Uh, and I wonder if you fly them both, do you even notice it? Um, I, I feel like the uh, the XLT uh, below 3,000 feet will outperform this with 40% more fuel burn, obviously. Uh, will outperform this. Once you get it between three and 5,000 feet, depending on your pressure, this one really starts to shine. So if you're flying at an uh, airport you know, in Colorado, this one is, uh, uh, is a lot better because it maintains that sea level power all the way up. Um, and it also gets faster with altitude because it doesn't have any power loss. So when you're higher, I, uh, I recently flew this, uh, I flew a demonstration up in the mountains in Colorado, and I can, uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that the takeoff performance, everything isn't that much different on this airplane compared to a, uh, compared to sea level. So even up in the mountains, uh, it was, uh, it was quite comfortable to flying around. The one thing you don't get is you don't get the drag on landing like you saw on the landing we did where yeah, we came Yeah, because you have the higher speed. Because the, uh, what happens is, because it's a compression engine, there's no spark, and the glow plugs won't work when you're airborne. Um, it, uh, it bumps in a little extra fuel the lower the pressure is, so the idle speed increases slightly as you go up in altitude. So, um. Okay, now speaking of altitude performance, I'll, th I'll show the graph here. Uh, this is the graph I, I prepared from the uh, POH. It's interesting to compare the two. The Lycoming will outrun the NG version, the, the diesel version, down low. But up uh, between four and 6,000 feet, the Lycoming uh, starts to fall off. But the Ostro, and you can see it in this shallow slope in the graph, the Ostro keeps going. So it, it continues to uh, accelerate at a higher speed because it's not losing any power. It's delivering that power all the way up to, what is it, 16,400 or something? Uh, the service ceiling is 16,400. It'll maintain that 92% power to about 13.8, uh, give or take. And then above that, it slowly starts bleeding off. The, the wastegates close and the turbos out of juice. Uh, but it'll it'll maintain uh, close to that all the way up to the service ceiling. The upshot of this is that this airplane, if you care to take it that high, uh, up to the high teens uh, or mid teens, I guess, you're going to see 150 knots on about, uh, what? Five and a half gallons, six gallons? Uh, a little bit more than that, but yeah, uh, you'd be running, to get 150 knots, you'd probably have to be running it somewhere, uh, I don't know, 80, 85 percent. So yeah, about seven and a half gallons an hour mm -hmm. to, to get that max speed. Um, I mean, if, even if we ran it at full power, which is 92 percent, which is max continuous, we're still only burning uh, 8.3, 8.2, 8.3 gallons an hour. Yeah, which is more than the Lycoming is, or less than the Lycoming is burning down low. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's about 40% more fuel efficient than the light coming. So, and uh, I'll show another graph here. And it's interesting what this does to range. The the NG carries less fuel, and I suppose that's a function of well needing less fuel and also not a, a, a weight and balance function as well. 
uh, and it's uh, 39 gallons is the standard. That's actually the long range tankage, but everybody gets the 39 yeah, gallon Yeah, in, in North America, we've we've just standardized the long range option as the option to have. So the uh, the loss of useful load of you know the extra 10 gallons of fuel or whatever it was. And the Lycom is carrying 51 gallons, uh, 51 gallons usable. And if uh, you look at the, the the two comparisons in range. Um, because of its lower fuel burn and actually slightly higher speed depending on the altitude, the NG has a slight range advantage. And down low, let's see, my calculation was uh, it's the difference between about uh, 400 uh, mile, uh, uh, full tanks, the difference between uh, 500 to 600 miles is about a 100 mile difference. Okay. And if the seats are full, it still enjoys an advantage, and it's actually a little bit more, as you can see from the graph. Uh, and the reason for that is the efficiency. The airplane is simply burning less fuel, but it's going pretty fast. Yeah. So it's got, it's got good performance. A standard throwaway line in aviation journalism is that an airplane is easy to land. Well, except for a few, they're all easy to land. But the DA-40 is also fun to land because the control forces are so nicely balanced and you can manipulate them precisely with a well-positioned center stick. When I flew the NG for this report, the wind was about 18 knots gusting to 25 with a slight crosswind component. No sweat at all, which explains why the DA-40 has such a low landing accident rate. The NG has a neat trick, too. You probably noticed it has a three-blade prop, and at idle, these present more drag, especially because the Austro engine has a high compression ratio. So that means if you're high on the approach, idling the power will make the airplane come down like an anvil. Just a slight bit of power neutralizes the sink and the airplane glides normally. You can also forward slip it, but with that prop trick, there's really no need. So that's a pretty good summary of the DA-40NG. Uh, uh, I've been at uh, Diamond for a few days now, and right now it's the only thing coming down the assembly line, although the, uh, the company is beginning to manufacture the uh, Lycoming version, the XLT version, um, uh, by order. And you can find a, a full report, including performance comparisons on the DA-40NG and the February 2020 issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine. With Jared Curtis, I'm Paul Bertarelli, reporting from London, Ontario. Thanks for watching. <laughs>